All right, ladies and gentlemen, it's the man, Matt Perino. Uh, you're looking good in that sunshine, my guy. Tell me, you you seem to have some nuggets for us today. What's happening today? It feels it feels good. It, it was pretty dark skies this afternoon, and it, and it felt like that because we were going into today's practice with uh, two healthy tight ends, uh, Tommy Sweeney, the seventh-round rookie, and uh, blocking extraordinaire Lee Smith. It looks like Dawson Knox has a hamstring tweak. Uh, Josh Allen actually talked a little bit about it uh, in his post-practice uh, press conference, and he said, listen, I told him, stay positive. It's, uh, it's a setback. You're going to miss some time. But the most important thing is you stay focused. You stay mentally uh, you know, with the team because he still has to progress. He still has to learn the playbook. And when he comes back, you have to make an immediate impact. It was it was weird that it happened today because I saw Tyler Croft walking around the practice facility with a boot on. So I don't know if I'm losing connection. I'll walk back down here. Um, but yeah, overall, uh, from an offense offensive perspective, I thought practice today was uh, definitely better uh, than recent days. I thought Josh Allen looked really crisp. Uh, obviously, Cole Beasley. We talked a lot about him early on in camp, uh, about kind of just not being on the same page with Josh Allen yet and the fact that it was going to take some time for them to kind of develop some chemistry. And you could tell they've been in the lab, man. They've been working on this day after day, talking uh, uh, a lot today about body language. He said that – Josh Allen said that he can tell already after four days in minicamp now, he could start to see little tells in Cole Beasley's body language, which tells him – if he's in man coverage and he moves his body a certain way, then he knows where to put the mm -hmm. ball. And you saw that crispness already, which I'm, I'm sitting here thinking, Cole Beasley told us, give us a week. We're four days later, and we're already seeing significant upgrades. See, I, I'm very encouraged by Cole Beasley because uh, if, uh, if you guys caught my live a few days ago, I was giving you guys my X factor on defense and offense, and Cole Beasley was my X factor on offense. I feel that the offense is not going to run through him, but he's going to be such an integral part in opening up the offense to John Browns, to Zay Jones, uh, to Singletary or McCoy. So Cole Beasley, a.k.a. Young 2%, He's going to be doing big things in this offense. I feel it. And that connection is already working. Um, I do have some questions, though, sir. Um, Josh Allen, ups and downs. How is our quarterback looking? Um, yeah, there's definitely some ups and downs. I mean, uh, two days ago I thought, you know, was his most inconsistent day on the practice field so far of the four practices. I thought today it could have gotten started in a real bad way. Uh, Try to hit John Brown over the middle, and he threw it probably – two or three yards behind him, and Tredavious White picked it off. And I'm sitting there like, oh, man, you know how I talk about him being a rhythm-based quarterback, rhythm-based player. I thought it was going to go off track real quick. But he, you know, he's composed. He understands things better. I was talking to Ray-Ray McLeod after practice today, and I'm like, everybody's talking up Ray-Ray McLeod, uh, Sean McDermott, Brian Dable. And I'm like, w w how does that feel knowing that these guys are, you know, believing in you, they, they see the work that you put in the offseason and the – you know, the change that you made to your game. He's like, man, I'm just looking at my man, Josh Allen, who's leading the whole ship. And I'm sitting here watching him, you know, responsible for all of us out here. And I'm sitting here saying, if he can do that with all of us, I can just be responsible for myself and what I have to do on the field. So um, I think Josh Allen looked, um, he looked poised. He looked, um, the, the balls were where they needed to be. There was one ball to Cole Beasley, man. He had like a real little stop. Little stutter step, stop and go, wheel route. Josh Allen blistered one right over the head of Matt Milano. Perfectly placed, Beasley with the grab, 15 yard catch, third and eight. You run that play up, Dable dials that one up. Bills fans are going to be liking it. Now, I, I will say this though, um, I love I love hearing the encouraging words that the coaching staff is giving uh, Ray Ray McLeod, and I've been reading some good things. But let's go back two years when they were doing the very same thing with Sammy Watkins and talking him up and this, that, and the third, and then a few weeks later, traded. I'm not saying that could happen, but we, we like you said before, not too high, don't get too low, because these guys, they'll try to talk you up just so they can give you some trade, uh, get some trade ac like accommodations for you. So it's one of those things that you got to really be careful of what staff staff members say, because 
it's still a it's still a game that's got to be played. So how do you feel about that? Could I could I be onto something or not? Nah? Yeah, I mean, the way that you you, you phrase that, I mean, I, I kind of like your line of thinking because it's going to be hard for Ray Ray McLeod to make this team. Even if he stands out in preseason, you go back to last year when Josh Allen threw that first touchdown pass to Ray Ray, and we were talking about it, you know, in, in camp and then in the preseason, they were developing a little bit of a rapport. So I think that it's going to be an uphill climb for any of these kind of on the outside. Cam Phillips has looked great in practice, man. But I just don't see a place on the 53-man roster for the kid. And, you know, the more you talk about, you know, Ray-Ray McLeod and the fact that Brandon Bean used a draft pick on him, and you know how much he values that draft capital and, you know, his draft picks and building the foundation, it does make sense that they can build him up a little bit and maybe, uh, you know, get a pick back for him if they don't have a place on the roster. Because I do think that, you know, I was talking to uh, Marcel Louis-Jacques uh, from uh, ESPN, the new ESPN reporter. He covered... Ray Ray McLeod at Clemson. He said, man, this dude has got crazy talent when he's got the ball in his hand. So it, you'd hate to give up on somebody like that just because they need playmakers. And if Josh Allen can get the ball in his hand so he can make some plays, we can watch that, see what unfolds. But, yeah, I'm right there with you, man. It's going to be really tough for him to make this team. It will be. And I don't say that to be negative. I just say it to kind of just put things out there for people. Now, I, I know you've got time. Um, you've got to go do other things. So I just got a few more questions. I'll let you be on your way. Um, I need to know more about Duke Williams and Sills. And you know what? We'll, we'll throw in Isaiah McKenzie. I'm not hearing what I want to hear about David Sills and Duke Williams. Can you speak more on that? Yeah, to be honest with you, Duke, Duke didn't really stand out too much today. Uh, I was kind of trying to keep my eyes open, but it was like I said, it was the Cole Beasley show. David Sills uh, continues to be... Uh, you know, pretty non-existent in terms of, you know, making plays in the team drills. He's, he's just like a big receiver. He's kind of, uh, he's got really thin legs and I, I don't see necessarily the quickness. And I think that he's learning at a, at a rapid pace and it's a big adjustment from the college game to the NFL game. And I, and I just think that I think if, if you have either of those guys in your place, I'll tell you right now, I think Robert Fa or I think Andre Roberts, has uh, some potential upside in this offense. I think Brian Dable likes his versatility as a playmaker. You saw what he did in the retur return game last year in the two games against the Jets. I think they think they, they, think they can utilize his athleticism, his uh, quickness, to get, kind of get him involved in you know, the reverse game, get him the ball in space and see if he can make some plays. And because of that position flex, he offers so much in special teams. I think that, you know, the more and more as we progress through camp, I think that we could be looking at five Brown, Foster, Jones, um, John Brown, Cole Beasley, and Andre Roberts. Very interesting. Now, I need to jump onto the other side of the ball. Defense. And more specifically, Voshan Joseph. Are we seeing anything from him? Uh, Jaquan Johnson. Are we seeing anything from our rookies on the defensive side of the ball? Yeah, so Voshan Joseph was today was the first day that I thought that I saw uh, Joseph and Tyrell Dotson uh, running on the third team defense. It looked like Voshan Joseph was running out of the middle linebacker position, which is at a very interesting development because he was okay. he kind of kind of looks more like that outside pass rusher type of linebacker. So, but what I like about maybe him getting some reps at middle linebacker is. If he's good enough and shows out enough and can beat Tremaine Edmonds back up, you can move on from Julian Stanford because I think Boshan Joseph is going to play some special teams. And then you're talking about opening up another roster spot for maybe a receiver, maybe another tight end, or maybe a TJ Yeldon that are going to have a tough time making this roster if you don't start you know, taking some of these guys that play special teams like a Julian Stanford whose position right now is so important. And you have to keep Boshan Joseph because he's a fifth-round rookie. So... Yeah, he played out there with Dotson today. I was pretty impressed with Dotson on the low. Like, I, I, I thought that he showed some real quickness, some real ability and coverage. Uh, but, again, third team, second day of pads. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to monitor that as we go. But, you know, that's something interesting. To, to They really like Dotson. I, I read a couple articles that put him as one of the top un, uh, undrafted free agent signings of all the rookie class this year. Obviously, he's got some off-the-field uh, issues that he's got to deal with. But, you know, from an athletic – athleticism standpoint, I, I really like what I've seen out of him. So, do you, do you have more time for a couple questions, or are you good? Yeah, man, I'm, I'm in the I like it, I like it, Rochester okay, so I got more. Heat, so, so give, so okay, give me your fire. So, 
I'm not I'm not pleased that I'm not hearing Tynaseki's name in the offensive rotation in first team. I'm not pleased about it. But I'm also impressed that Feliciano and Spencer Long are getting more touches. What's going on with Tynaseki? Yeah, I think Ty and Seki, I, I think they're just trying to do so much with them that uh, you wonder if he, it's just the lack of consistency isn't really allowing him to separate himself quite yet. So you got him, you know, lining up on, on the right side in some drills, and then you're making him your, your top left tackle on the second team uh, in all the team drills. That I think that, you know, playing that swing tackle role, you're not going to stand out as much because you're, you're constantly going back and forth. There's, a dis- there's distinct differences in the responsibilities of both sides. I mean, I think that quickness and that, that, that ability to get off the line of scrimmage quickly into your blocks with using your footwork, it's more important on the left side. I think the right side, mm-hmm. you're, you're more known for your ability to you know, run block, and that's why I think a lot of people question the, the idea of moving him to that right side because that's not really where he excels. His, he's able to stand up quickly, you know, turn away those edge rushes, and I think that Been impressed, which is a good thing, with the defensive pass rushes. We got to see the the one on one drills the other day. Trent Murphy, man, like he is looking like a totally different dude. I talked to Lorenzo Alexander today, and he said you can totally in his body from from last year to this year in terms of him getting to a level of health that he is just flying around the corner. He uh, he made uh, Cody Ford. He embarrassed Cody Ford in one on one drills. I felt I felt bad for the kid. I was like, man. But then again, Daryl Johnson Jr. embarrassed him as well. So Cody Ford is is really having a tough time getting himself assimilated to the. And then you got questions at the press conference for Dable and McDermott asking they thought about moving him inside the guard. So you know it's a slow process for Cody Ford. I think we're going to learn a lot about him from a mental perspective because. He's, he's gotten it taken to him in practice so far in the first couple of days of uh, practice. And I, I think I got stung by a bee just now, so that's good. Don't worry, you're tough. You're, you're an MMA guy. You're an UFC guy. That's nothing to you. Yeah, uh, man. You, no. just, you, just, you just brush them <laughs> off. Keep going. You brush it off. Um, how's, how's our number one overall pick? Our number one. Our, our number nine overall pick. How's he doing? Yeah, man. Uh, Ed Oliver is uh, – he's had his moments. Uh, I definitely will say one of my observations so far, and he's playing only on the second team, is that he's really, uh, you can notice when he gets stuffed up in double teams. He gets himself kind of clogged up on the line, and you can, you Mm -hmm. know, some of those size concerns I think are going to come back around um, if he continues to struggle once you get into that game setting. But, you know, the speed and the burst and the quickness, that's all there, but he's still trying to see if, to figure out how that fits into the scheme and what Sean McDermott is asking him to do. Okay. Uh, there was one play where I did see, uh, it was kind of low key and I, and they ran to the other side of the line. So he didn't have an impact on the play, but man, he got in so quickly. I think it was Vlad Dukas who he sp- spun him right around. So I think that there's, there's going to be moments as we go along. I think I wrote about this as well, where you're going to see um, him start, the, the lights start to go on and figure out a way that he can, kind of force his will a little bit on the offensive line that he's going up against. And I, I can't wait to see him in a game setting because I think he needs I think he needs game reps to really start to figure out, okay, this is what's going to work. This is how I can get inside. This is how I can use my leverage here or maybe my get off here. And I think we'll learn more in the games. Now, everybody has, has somewhat uh, built up their 53-man roster. I'm sure you've done your piece. Do you see a lot of changes happening where you're like, ooh, well, I thought this was going to be the 53, man, but this player is stepping up, this player is not. He might look like he might not be on this team by the time 53-man roster is set. Has anybody stood out to you that's like, oh, I don't know if he's going to make that roster? You know, it's a good question. You know, I think um, from, from the perspective of, you know – Nobody on the first team on either side of the ball has really put themselves in that category yet. But one person I was, I was kind of expecting, you know, to, to really make an impact, uh, bring over some, some championship experience from the Patriots was Adrian Waddle, who uh, I was able to play with in the, celebra- or in the, uh, 
uh, BBG Charities kickball game. I, I really enjoyed my time with him, but it seemed like he's, he's really been struggling. And again, they're asking him to move to the left and the right side as they try to test out different formations. And he's just looked a little bit lost at times and uh, still getting himself um, used to it. Listen, you play on that New England Patriots offensive line last year. They were one of the best in the league. So to come yep. here – uh, and start to mix it up with guys that are, you know, you're trying to, it's, it's a completely new look, a completely new coach. I, I think there's some, some growing pains, but I'm definitely keeping my eyes on Waddle because I, I had high expectations for him and so far not quite living up to, to what I had going into training camp. I'm, I'm going to throw you a wrench of a question right now, and it's a quick one. I need your answer right off the bat. Don't even think about it. Just go. If Nate Peterman would be put on this team right now, could he beat out Tyree Jackson? No, 100% not. I've been impressed with Tyree Jackson, man. I, I, Good. I, you, you know why? Because not, not to, the, to the degree where I'm even going to entertain or even participate in a conversation about a number two quarterback battle because I think Matt Barkley's got that concrete lockdown. But I think Tyree Jackson at this stage, you know, in front of, you know, with, with some of the knocks on him coming out of school and then seeing him at rookie minicamp kind of fly some balls and, kind of like, you know, almost give me flashbacks to Josh Allen as, you know, as a rookie and when some of the early struggles he had. He's been comfortable this week, man. He, he's come in. He's, he's executed what they've asked him to do. A couple of bad balls here and there, a couple times where he let the defense get in the backfield, but he's a rookie, and that's going to happen. Uh, he's, got a, he's got a nice ball. He's big. He's fast. And I think that, you know, long term, if you're talking about the next three, four, five years, if they can mold him into the ideal backup for Josh Allen, I think you're getting a steal of a player in Tyree Jackson because, because of the upside. I, I had to throw that in there. I knew the answer. I just wanted to see how you'd react to it, and you reacted quite well, sir. I'll give you that. Um, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, this is Matt Perino uh, from Buffalo Bills NY Up. Um, is, the, is Devin Singletary the real deal? The real deal, man, and I'm not even getting looked. Listen, we've already covered back during minicamp what the guy brings as a runner. Nobody was talking about this guy as a pass catcher, and he is so smooth. Like, he caught a ball today. Listen, I'm not t trying to throw shade at Shady, you know. I I'm, I'm, I'm at this point, I want to see LaShawn McCoy with his back up against the wall go out there in 2019 and prove what he's got left. So I, I agree. We'll, we'll, we'll hold off on that. But when it comes to Singletary, I was talking to Ryan Talbot, my tag team partner over at uh, uh, NY Up today. He was out at camp with me. And we were talking about, you ever notice when LaShawn McCoy catches the ball in the backfield, it's always kind of like, you know, a, a, a kind of herky-jerky motion where he's got to, like, contort his body to catch the ball, and then he's got to reset and, and move his body to, in the direction of where he's going to run. And it's almost like a three-step process. Today, Singletary stood out to me the most because he caught a ball from Josh Allen, where he actually did have to make a, a movement with his body to contort a little bit to catch it, and it all happened in this one fluid motion where he was still in that moment. By the time he caught the ball, he was ready to run, and it was almost like three-quarters of a second quicker than anything I've seen LaShawn McCoy do when he catches the ball. So I, I'm so excited about the upside as a receiver that Singletary brings to this offense because okay. they had okay. no, none of that last year. You're right. I'm trying, and I'm trying. I'm trying to think of something now. Now, but here, here's the thing. You, you're. We're bringing in pass catching. We're, we're talking about the running back position. I can't. I can't not bring up Patrick Demarco. Where does he fit in on all of this? I hate to uh, bum you guys out, man, but I still think he's making this roster. He, they, they're lining him up. They're lining him up in the slot. They're ri lining him up on the outside. He's in. You know, for all the running plays with the two back sets, I, he plays all the special teams. He's probably going to be a captain. I just, um, if I know Sean McDermott, and I know they're going to have a lot more, you know, tough decisions to make on the, on the bottom of this roster, but they love themselves some Patrick DeMarco. And it's, listen, it, there's something to be said about locker room stability and guys that really are leaders in the room. But, you know, when you're talking about flipping around a passing game that was 31st in the league last year, and you're, you're telling me you're trying to fix things and you're, and you're only willing to bring five receivers into 2019 when you, you potentially could have a playmaker like Isaiah McKenzie or Ray Ray McLeod, you know, substitute a, a Patrick DeMarco. I just, that, that becomes a very interesting discussion. It'll be interesting to see what Sean McDermott does.
one of our one of our members, uh, Joe Trippy, he asks, "Is Morse and Ford are only locks on this O line? Excuse me, Morse and Dawkins are only locks on this offensive line." Okay, because I was going to say, I don't think Ford's a lock yet, man. Like, he's struggling right now. And I think, you know, I, I'm, I'm expecting he's going to figure it out. Listen, from everybody I've talked to, you know, interviews that I've, that, that I've done with, with Cody and people that know him, they're, they're all about what he's going to bring at this level, especially as a run blocker. And that's obviously what they need to be better at this year. I think your, your, your third lock on that offensive line is Quentin Spain. He hasn't moved out of that left guard spot. I think he brings like 48 – he brings 48 starts in um, four NFL seasons, and uh, Pro Football Focus graded every guard in the league last year in terms of their run-blocking abilities. Quentin Spain is the only guy on the roster that played more than three games last year that's in the top 100 guards from last season in terms of run-blocking. So he's, you know, if you want to get that run game going, you're going to need Quentin Spain on, on the field, and they've kept him there with the first team all, all, uh, all, all camp long. Football aside, you mentioned your partner in Ryan Talbot, uh, your Bill, your Bills partner in Ryan Talbot. How's the camaraderie with all the other media guys and the guys that are covering camp? Are you guys all huddled in one spot? Are you guys all spread out? Do you guys share notes with each other? How does that work when you guys are all there watching the same thing? What's the difference? What do you what do you do to stand out? Well, I will say that I've been pleasantly. Um, I don't want to say surprise, but I, I've, I've really enjoyed coming onto the, the media scene here because it is a, a really legit, respected, respectable people that have helped me out on the beat. You know, you, you go from Tim Graham, Matthew Fairburn, Joe Biscaglia, uh, Vic Carucci, uh, Sal Marana, Sal Capaccio. I, I, can li- I could go all the way down the list. Uh, John Scott, people that have just kind of like, you know, we're all competitors, and, and, and there's definitely a sense of that. Like, we're all, you're right, we're all trying to stand out. And I, and I like to think that I bring a certain level of digital, uh, digital mindedness in, in this age of journalism where I like to stand out on social media. I like to do a lot of video, a lot of audio, uh, along with all the stories that I bring you guys. So that's how I try to stand out. Everybody kind of has their niche. And, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a fun group of people, and I think that, you know, the Bills Mafia – I was in Las Vegas. Um, I, I, I have a lot of friends in the Florida area. And it's not like this everywhere where you've got so many kind of, you know, trustworthy news outlets that you can go to that have multiple people that you can read and watch and listen to. So, yeah, we're set up pretty good. And, and, and I don't want to leave out the, uh, one of the best fan blogs out there, Buffalo Fanatics. I mean, you guys are doing some good stuff. And I, and I think that it's, you know, over the course of time, as we move further and further into the digital age, man, like, this is the type of stuff that people want, engaging content, engaging conversation. Like, every time I watch a live IG video with Rico, why do you think I'm always saying that I'm going to come on here? It's because I, I'm engaged just talking to the guy, you know, and, and I like I that. I like, engaging, I like engaging conversation. So, yeah, man, I, I think we got an awesome scene here. I was telling my wife the other day, I'm so jacked up for the season because I came in blind last year. I started a week before camp. So I had this now this full season to get comfortable, and now I'm dude, I'm ready. I'm I'm ready to go, man. I'm locked in. We got content coming out the ears, and we're, we're just we're just getting started. I'm I'm gonna tell everybody right now. Whoever's following right now, you need to go over to social media platforms and follow Matt Perino right now. This guy is legit. Engaging is the thing of it's it's the thing now. You want to reach people, you have to be engaging. And like you said, the, the digital social media game is only going to ascend. It's not descending. It's, it's getting up there. And when you connect like this, we're here to bridge the gap. And with guys like Perino and myself and other news outlets, we bridge the gap from the fans to what's on the field. And this is why Buffalo Fanatics does what we do. We do this because it's fun for us, and it's cool. Look at this. We've got people asking a whole bunch of questions, and I apologize. I can't get to everybody, but there's some really great questions that are being asked right now uh just by joe trippy asking about the two guys on the old line uh, i'm not going to keep it much longer i'm going to ask one more question tell me how you feel about this season right excuse me the training camp right now and what you saw compared to last year to now is there huge differences is it a night and day i think it's, it's definitely night and day and i think it starts with josh allen like you know you could just tell the the discomfort of the unknown with him last year. You know, he was trying to get, learn his playbook. He had, he didn't have really much guidance in his room. You talk about Peterman and McCarron and that's fine. 
But David Culley, do you know something interesting? I, I just really thought of this today. He's so quick to talk about Brian Dable and Ken Dorsey every chance he gets and how much he's learning from him. I don't think he's really mentioned David Culley's name in like the last eight or nine months. So I, just think about that. That's where he was at last year. And now you could just tell in the way that, you know, he just finished a whole, you know, the composure. He just finished a practice, and then he goes and spends 40, 50, 60 minutes signing autographs, taking pictures with kids, um, you know, just shaking hands, holding babies. We put a picture up on, on our Instagram page of him holding the little baby today. I mean, he just got it down. He's comfortable. And that, that, that attitude, that, that confidence, that comfort level permeates throughout the entire team. And you're seeing in even guys like Ray Ray McLeod, who at times last year, you remember he was benched. I mean, he just couldn't figure out for the life of himself. So, you know, I, I think there's just a, a confidence level. And I think that there's, you know, I think there's also a feeling on both sides of the ball that they can trust one another. Last year, the offense, they knew they can rely on the defense, but I don't know if that feeling was reciprocal. I don't know if, you know, Lorenzo Alexander, if he was being totally honest with you, if he said, yeah, I have faith that if we, if we shut things down, our offense is going to score enough points to win games. So I think that they're starting to see that, the progression, and uh, there's a lot of confidence. But, hey, remember, it's only July. It's only July. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm not going to keep you much longer. You are the man. I'm telling you right now. I'm telling you right now. This guy's legit. Matt Perino with Buffalo Bills NY Up. Appreciate the time that you put in. I appreciate the pieces that you've written uh, for everybody to read. Go check out the website. Go check out Matt Perino on Twitter and all the social media platforms. You guys know who brings the best with Buffalo Fanatics. Matt Perino, thank you very much for your time. We will do this again. I'll put the bat, in this, I'll bat, I'll put the bat signal up sometime soon, but you, Pete, you keep on the lookout for that. As always, man, this is this is one of my favorite. This is my. Fa I'm gonna. I'm actually gonna break some news. This is my favorite interview podcast conversation. This, this is it right here, man. This is. Uh, anytime you need me, I'm there. Say the name. Who is it? Is Buffalo what? Buffalo fanatics. Hey, my, my guy, Matt Perino. I appreciate the time. Listen, have yourself a great day. I'll be seeing you guys. I'll be checking on you on Tuesday because that's when that's when we're back on the field and doing all that good stuff, right? Yep. Sounds good. I'll see you then. All right, man. Take care.